Mr. Ambassador, what were the international expectations as we entered the Nuremberg trials? And looking back upon it, what was achieved, literally? Well, I'm, the expectation was that uh, there'd be accountability for these crimes and, uh, and that uh, the other new thing beyond uh, going after the top leaders, the top surviving leaders, which had never been done before, as, as Jackson said, uh, the law should not just stop at petty crimes by small men. It should, it should reach uh, the men in great positions who by their concerted actions set in motion evils that leave no home in the, in the world untouched. Uh, but it also was the idea that there was individual criminal responsibility. Uh, there had been this attitude that international law only applied to states. And so uh, uh, you could maybe go to the International Court of Justice and get a judgment against the state because it had breached the treaty. Uh, in this situation, they said uh, uh, the crimes are committed by, by real men. They're not com committed by abstract entities. And if you want to enforce international law, you have to punish those responsible uh, for the crimes. And uh, uh, this was a proceeding that, uh, that, that Jackson, uh, in, his, in his opening speech, uh, said would, would seek to uh, condemn the Nazis, uh, not by the, uh, the evidence of the victors, but by the evidence of the Nazis themselves, who had been, as he said, meticulous record keepers. And it was possible by their own records uh, to abundantly prove their responsibility for these crimes. Mr. Rouse, you're involved now with a huge responsibility at the State Department. And I'm wondering what is the linkage between what we've been talking about, Nuremberg and the trials, and your current effort to try to find some way of taking the lessons of Nuremberg and apply them to today's search against those people responsible for crimes against humanity. Well, we, we had this period after Nuremberg of the Cold War where it was impossible to hold anyone to account. But after the end of the Cold War, when we had the atrocities in Yugoslavia and Rwanda, uh, the world, the United Nations Security Council, went back to the Nuremberg precedents and, and essentially took, for instance, the uh, provisions on, on crimes against humanity from the Nuremberg Charter, on which the Nazis had been charged, together with the other crimes, and, and put them in the statute of the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia and, and for Rwanda. And so uh, with, with relatively little variation, uh, at least in the area of crimes against humanity, uh, we've been trying those responsible for the Rwanda genocide and the crimes in Yugoslavia uh, on the same law that was established at Nuremberg. And, and then other courts have subsequently been created, mixed courts and, uh, to, to try in other places, and the International Criminal Court which we're not a member, but 114 countries are, uh, and uh, it's, it's law on crimes against humanity. Again, with, with some additions, uh, comes from Nuremberg. What then, Mr. Ambassador, are the large unanswered questions, the needs that have to be addressed today? Well, the, the need, the largest need, is, is how you obtain state cooperation, how, how you uh, uh, investigate, uh, get uh, the evidence, uh, uh, how you arrest the people that are charged. At, at Nuremberg, as has been noted, there was the an occupation government in Germany. Uh, the, the four powers had total and complete power to do what they needed to do to arrest people, to hold the trial, to execute them. Uh, in what we've established since 1993 under the United Nations is, is still recognizes that this is a, a world of states uh, we have to have each state cooperate if we're going to get what we want to do. And, and that uh, creates a situation where it's often very difficult uh, to bring people to trial. Uh, with the Yugoslavia Tribunal, uh, it was possible by using conditionality, by essentially countries in the former Yugoslavia couldn't move toward the EU unless they gave up their war criminals. I mean, you use that political tool, and that's made it possible for that court to arrest about 148 of its 150 fugitives. In the Rwandan case, because that the, the genocidal government was overthrown, and the accused uh, uh, traveled the world and ended up in about 26 different countries, uh, countries were willing to uh, adhere to their obligations under the UN Charter, which is binding on them, because it was a Security Council resolution, and turn those folks over and send them to Arusha. Now with the International Criminal Court, uh, they're relying on Sudan to, uh, uh, to arrest al-Bashir, their own president, and send him to The Hague. Obviously, that's not going to occur. Uh, this morning, the prosecutor of the ICC, as I think everyone has heard, has, uh, has indicted uh, 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 Momar, or has sought, to be quite precise, sought arrest warrants. Uh, had to go to the judges. Judges are going to sit on this for three to four weeks. But he sought arrest warrants against Muammar Gaddafi, 
his son Saif and the head of the Secret Service, uh, Abdullah al-Sanusi, for, for crimes against humanity, persecution, the crime that Streicher was convicted of, by the way, at, at Nuremberg. Uh, but um, they ask him, well, where are you going to get cooperation? Well, I'll seek cooperation first from the government of Libya. Obviously impossible uh, in, in the sense that, uh, that, uh, that Gaddafi is the, the head of Libya. On the other hand, he then said, but then he turned to the Security Council and perhaps asked the Security Council for a resolution similar to what they did with the no-fly zone that might authorize international forces to go in and get an arrest. Uh, that's never been done. Whether countries are ready to do that is, is still a very, very open question. But the, the point is it's very difficult to enforce these measures, and to the extent that now in the ICC you have 14 people indicted and only five of them that have been arrested, uh, this creates the perception that maybe you can do the crime and, and get away with it. Do you think, Professor, that the, the issue of genocide is a very large one with this community and probably all over the world today? The ambassador has just spelled out, I think very eloquently, the problems involved in trying really to establish a smoothly functioning international criminal system that will deal with the issue of genocide. Do you believe that in the next, what, 10, 20, 50 years, we're going to have an international system in place that would allow for an international criminal court that everyone, everyone would subscribe to? No one would have believed that the immovable a uh, fact of, our, of, of the post-war half century would have changed. And in the aftermath of the end of the Cold War, the idea that there's a court at all, that there are a, a, a bunch of courts, uh, is remarkable. Whether it will go farther, I mean, if, if I, don't, I don't take odds. I have, just this week, one of my oldest defendants, and I was the junior most lawyer on the case, got convicted, Din Myanyuk. He was... Um, when I went to the Justice Department in the early 80s, the case was already five years old. Um, this is 30 years now. Uh, I don't, I mean, I have Holocaust uh, survivors in my family. None of them feel particularly vindicated or that their story was told because this, this old man is convicted and the judge you know, announced how terrible it was, but he would be, uh, he's, he's not, he's under house uh, release. Um, I don't know that the international process is all that it's uh, built up to be. I, whether it will be in effect, I don't know. But the idea that one <coughs> Cambodian has been convicted in all these years, and a pretty nasty guy is still in power. You know, a mid-level former Khmer Rouge is sort of smiling at the process and making sure it never reaches him or his loved ones. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I don't think it's just if, it only, if the process only went farther and we had more tribunals reaching farther, it would be, be better. I don't know that. Let me just add, because obviously in, in Cambodia, uh, they're about ready to begin in the next, in June, the trial of the four surviving leaders of the Pol Pot government. Killed two million of their own people, tried to take their country back to year zero, uh, including the number two person under Pol Pot and uh, the, 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 the titular chief of state, the foreign minister, and, and his wife, the social welfare minister. Uh, they'll be on trial. I mean, what's I tend to be more optimistic, though, whether we will have everyone in the ICC. I think that's, that's something you could question. But part of the principle of the ICC is that, uh, that the justice needs to be done somewhere, at the, at the local level, even at the regional level. And the ICC only is involved if there's no will or capacity at those lower levels. And I think we're seeing, I mean, I'm traveling all over just in Bangladesh. They're trying people for the 1971 atrocities that killed three million in Bangladesh. Everywhere when, when, when folks see a Milosevic brought to trial, uh, when they see a Charles Taylor brought to trial, when they see these cases where, where victims uh, are receiving justice, they say, is our blood not red? Is what happened to our people uh, insignificant in the world? And so there's a demand for justice and, and an effort to fulfill that justice, if not at the international level, at a regional or national level. And I think that pressure will continue. And even if people will, you'll have situations where people will be tried in countries other than their own potentially when they try to seek refuge. And so I, I think that we're moving toward a, a, a system, a, a hybridized one, uh, that will, I think, send a message uh, that if you commit crimes like genocide, uh, you'll face consequences. Occasionally, the U.S. has to hesitate uh, before accusing uh, countries of crimes. For example, 
in the post-war period, the United States picked and chose which Nazis to prosecute. Some of the Nazis were useful to us for scientific or intelligence reasons. And at other times, we have to worry about uh, our allies or we use these people because they're enemies of our enemies. Can you uh, comment on uh, the realities of this uh, and these choices that the United States has to make? I just wanted to jump in and there as a prosecutor, I, because it's clear that, you know, I, I always found people who would come in and say, why am, I not, why am I being charged? There's somebody else down the road that you didn't charge. That's never a defense. It's, it's the case that's before the court, whether this person did the crime, and, and they should face uh, consequences for it. Obviously, there's a lot to answer for during, this, uh, during the recent history, and in some of those countries that we're allied with, in Latin American countries, people that allied on our side with the, in the Cold War, who then committed a atrocities against their own people are, fa are facing consequences now uh, because of the, you know, amnesties from the 70s and 80s are being lifted. So uh, justice is being done. But I will say that going forward in the future, as, as we deal with policy and as we deal with allies in the world, this question about uh, uh, whether we're supporting bad guys or we're doing horrible things is, uh, is, is something that's in front of us all the time. And I think as we've discovered uh, during this spring in the Arab countries, the lying ourselves uh, with folks that are committing human rights violations may not in the end be a wise strategy, that indeed the best strategy is, is to work with people that, uh, uh, that, that don't commit atrocities. Ambassador, if you have a 30 second or so concluding thought that you'd like to leave us with. I, I saw it in Sierra Leone that when we prosecuted those that were the, the, the responsible for these horrible atrocities, that, uh, that the situation in terms of the rape, the, the killings dramatically fell, and that they were able then to go through elections without lethal violence, change power, and, and people had a chance to, to, to build their country back. And so I actually do think that, 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 that holding people to account can break this cycle of, of impunity and make it possible for people to live freely.